this series, I Love My Church. I love my church. I said, I love my church. You know, you can say I love pizza. I love the Kentucky Wildcats. I like the Kentucky Derby. 151,000 evidently did yesterday. It showed up in rain spooks and all that other good stuff. But when you say, I love my church, I mean, that raises eyebrows. Because then they start saying, what do you like about your church? And why do you like this? And blah, blah, blah. And so I can't think of a better reason why not to preach on I, why I love my church. And so we're going to be spending all month on I love my church. I asked 10 people, 10 people this week, this question outside of Elkhorn Baptist Church. The question I asked was, what do you think about church? What do you think about church? And here's their answer. It may come to a surprise to a lot of us, but here it is. Church is full of hypocrites. Yeah, your pastor's one of them. Church is boring. Evidently, you haven't came to the right church. I'm as good as most that go to church, so why do I need to go to church? I hear that all the time. I don't believe in church. Church is out of date. Out of style. Church is irrelevant. Church is no fun. Church is judgmental. Church is so predictable, I know what's going to happen before I show up. Well, again, they haven't came to Elkhorn. Only one person out of ten said this, these words. I love my church. Only one person out of ten said I love my church. So I just said, you know, Lord, we're going to shoot some truth out. I'm going to tell you why I love my church. I'm going to tell you some things today that hopefully will get down in your spirit. My prayer, my goal is to help you fall in love with your church. If you're a guest here today, I'm glad you're here, but I hope you love your church. If you don't love your church, you need to find a church that you do love. And I will tell you this, it's a, it's a cliche almost here at Elkhorn, but you've got to have a church that believes all the Bible and don't leave anything out of the Bible now it's gonna step on your toes it's gonna upset you but guess what welcome to life welcome to ministry um, so today you're looking at a man that is madly deeply crazy head over heels in love with Elkhorn Baptist Church I love my church somebody praise God how many of y'all love your church amen how many of you glad God's got you in a church that believes in the Holy Ghost and all the Bible. Amen? Oh, it's going to be a good service, I can tell already. And you know, here's what I have found out. We, you know, we may not always agree. Well, I don't agree with myself. I know we come from different backgrounds. And yes, I know we have hypocrites. But I've made my mind up. I'm not going to let a disagreement or a different background or a different culture or a hypocrite send this old preacher to hell. I'm here today because I love God, and I love what God loves, and God loves his church. He, he loves her so much he died for. And so, man, you've got to have a sacrificial love in your life that reaches past Sunday, that spills out into your Mondays and your Tuesdays and your Wednesdays. And, man, you wake up Thursday with Jesus on your mind. And, man, when you go to school, Jesus is on your mind. And when you're in your vehicle driving down the road, man, you, Jesus is on your mind. I can't get over him. I'm addicted to him. I love him. And I think the world needs to know who we're talking about. The world needs a Savior. And here's what I've noticed. If we'll lift him up, he will attract people into himself. That's why he hung around sinners. Why do you think he hung around sinners all the time? Because he, he loved them. And if we're going to be a church where people look at us, they're going to say, you know why I love Elkhorn? Because they don't judge me. You know why I love Elkhorn? It's because, man, I come from the wrong side of the tracks. But praise be unto God, I, I'm okay today because I'm at a church that I feel comfortable in that if I raise my hands, nobody won't look at me bad. Or if I got blue jeans on preaching, nobody won't look at me bad. Why do I love my church? Because this is really why I really believe this. We're the most loving, non-judgmental non people I've ever seen in my life. I love my church. 
Matthew chapter 16. It's a good word, and I want this to get in your spirit today. Had a good time at the first service, and we're going to have a good time in the second service. Verse 13, Matthew chapter 16. It says these words, if you don't have your Bible, you can look off your neighbor, or you can look at the big Bible on the screen. I'm reading out the NIV today. Title, I Love My Church. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, and notice he asked his disciples, the saved people, the ones who follow him. He asked them, who do people say the Son of Man is? Who do people say that I am? Verse 14, I imagine Jesus had a wake-up call here. It says, they replied, Lord, some call you John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others say Jeremiah or the one of the prophets. I love verse 15. He says, but what do you say about me? What about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Verse 16, Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Verse 17, Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed, listen to me, this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. Verse 18 says, And I tell you that you are Peter. You are my rock. <laughs> Listen, God called Peter his rock. He says, You're my rock. And I will build my, come on, I will build my, and the gates of Hades, Sheol, whatever you want to call it in your translation, hell's hell. He says, Hell, can't watch this, will not. Overcome it. Will not overcome you. Cannot overcome you. Watch this. This is written in red. He said these words, and I will give you, watch this, I will give you the keys. Everybody underline keys in your Bible. Of the kingdom of, oh, this is going to be a good word today. Thank you, Holy Spirit. He said, I will hand you the keys to heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And verse 20 is a very suspicious, very, I didn't understand this verse until this week. Really, God set me free with this. He says, then he warned his disciples not, not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. That messed me up. But today I want to show you and I want to teach you. I want to give you three things. And the first thing I want to give you, they had a problem. There was a problem. Listen to me. The problem was they truly did not know Jesus. Listen to me. They, I submit to you today that a lot of people and a lot of churches still truly do not know Jesus. You see, you can have a big church. You can have a big steeple. You can have all the good, great programs you want. But I'm telling you, that does not mean that you know Jesus. You can be here today. You can give your tithe. You can go to Sunday school. You can, you can know the ABCs of Mint, Believe, and Confess. But that does not mean you know Jesus. The problem was they knew about Jesus. They heard that he was a great Messiah. They heard there was a man that came to Jerusalem through a woman named Mary. He was born from a virgin. They, they knew these things. They had religion but they didn't have relationship. They had a form of religion, but listen to me, but they denied the power from within. Listen to me. The problem is they never settled in their heart that Jesus was Lord. They never, never settled in their heart that Jesus Christ was Lord of their life. Lord means ownership. Lord means I am bought with a price. You can't buy me. I'm sold out. I'm in it to win it. You can, I will not deny him because I know him. See, when you know him, you'll talk about him. The one you love the most is the one you'll talk about the most. The one you love the most is the one you'll talk about the most. See, my question to you this morning, and I want you to write this down. Do you really know Jesus? Listen to me, I'm not crazy enough just because I'm at a Baptist church or at a Bible belt that I, I'm sitting here, sitting here going, over probably 600 people will be here today, both services. I'm not 
crazy enough to sit here and say that everybody knows Jesus. Oh, you may know about him, but I've got to ask you a question. Do you know him? Do you know him? I'm going to ask you again, do you know him? Who is Jesus to you? Write it down. Who is Jesus to you? See, is he just a good old guy? <laughs> is, he, is he just a good old prophet? Is he just a good teacher, good leader? Or is he just another man in history? Or is he your Lord? Now listen to me, this is where the, the rubber meets the road. This is where you, as an individual, have to make this decision today. Right now, you're making a decision. You're making a decision who Jesus is to you. Who he is to you? Let me go ahead and break this and tell you the truth. I had to work out my own salvation. I, couldn't, I can't go to heaven on my grandma's coattails. I can't go to heaven on, my, on what my daddy did or what my mama did. I got to go to heaven on a personal, one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I can't go to heaven on my intellectualism. I cannot go to heaven because he was a good man. Or I went to Sunday school. You've got to get this religious stuff out of your mind. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? See, we can have all the religious activity. We can have two revivals a year like most Southern Baptist churches do the spring and the fall. Booyah. How's that working for you? You can have all the meetings you want, hire all the staff that you want. We can have all the bells and the whistles and the lights. We can pay this debt off today and build a whole nother church, have the biggest church with the biggest steeple. But if we don't have Jesus, if we don't have Jesus at the center, all you got the steeple house that's full of dead people and dead bones. Who is Jesus to you? That's a question that Jesus asked his disciples. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? And man, that just messed me up. It messed my week up. I'm sitting there going, God, I've never answered that question. I have never answered the question, who Jesus is to me? Until this week. And I had to chew on it. See, the problem, if all we got is the bells and the whistles and the lights and the big steeple and the big steeple house, all we are is cleaned and assembled. All we are is a light show. All we are is, a, man, they can do that at the bars. Matter of fact, they do. Led Zeppelin sells more tickets than, than churches do. You, I'm just telling you the truth this morning. You've got to make your mind up. You've got to write down in your book, in your notes right now, who is Jesus to you? The second point I want to give you. I want to go back just one, one thing. I want to tell you this. If Jesus is not first in your life, everything else is distorted. At home, if he's not first, it's distorted. At school, wherever you're at, and you say, Brian, I can't pray at school. Yes, you can. Yes, you can in the name of Jesus. You can. You can. Because what God said, told me in my prayer time this week, if I'm in you and I'm for you, nobody can stop you. Hallelujah. And I mean that with all of my heart. Nobody can stop me. But if your eyes is on anything else in a relationship, at home, with your children, no matter where you're at, money, finances, if your eyes is on that, everything else will be distorted. It won't be a clear picture. People ask me all the time. They say, what in the world's going on at Elk Corner? Why is this happening? This happening? I, I'm going to be honest with you. Why I love my church? I really feel for the first time in my life I can honestly God say, Jesus is first. First. We've had, you all you know, you know my biggest problem that's been here at Elk Corner? It, it's been a problem. Outsiders are trying to come inside and change who we are. Trying to tell us what we need to be. What we need, how we need to preach. And what we need to think. But can I tell you the honest to God's truth? And this morning from your pastor's heart, we will not change. We will not change. And we will not change. We're going forward. We've got souls. Jesus on the cross is number one. We're not backing down. We're not shutting up. We believe that Jesus is the answer. 
Come on. He's the answer to all things. In your, in your marriage, Jesus. At home, Jesus. Wherever, Jesus is in. Woo! Thank you, Lord. It's Jesus all the way. And how in the world? Why would you back down? Why? There comes a time in your life that you got to say, it's not about me, my decision, but whatever I'm thinking, I, just give me Jesus. If it's not first, watch this. You're going to have a messed up, distorted life. So, Brian, how you know? Been there? Done that, baby. What's this? I still sometimes go there, but I don't like to stay too long. I don't want a distorted life. I don't want clouds around the cross. I want to see the sun, the S-O-N, hallelujah, on the cross. I don't want to mess up. I'm going toward the cross, and I'm going to die that way. I've made my mind up. I'm not going to shut up. Hallelujah. The second thing is this. There was a problem, but I love what Jesus did. He always gives second third, fourth, fifth, sixth, thousandth chances. I look at a bunch of them right now. How many of you are glad that you're still right now? God still got a hold. He's not letting go. He's still Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm so thankful this morning. People say all the time, say, Brian, boy, you get red face, you dag on right. If I get red face over a dang horse going around the track in two minutes, I believe I can get to He's going to come back on the horse. It's going to be a white one. Number two is the solution. There's a problem, but God always has a solution. He's always got an answer. He will meet a woman at the well who has five husbands and living with a man. And he'll step to her and go, you know I love you? You know who I am? He asked her the same question, Greg. You know who I am? She said, there's something different about you. How many of you know when we leave here today and wherever restaurants you go to or if you go home, there should be something different about you. The best sermon ever preached was this. He said, Brian, why don't you try that? I know what y'all thinking. People should be able to look at your life and see a glow about you. People should be able to look at your life and say, man, there's there's just something, why are they so happy? You know, people give Joe Osteen a lot of trouble, a lot of heartache. He smiles too much. What do y'all want him to do, Slim? Look, look how big your church is. Are you jealous? Man, blessed be the name. Who cares if he smiles, if he's got dentures, if his teeth are yellow? Keep smiling. Well, I've got a lot to smile about. I've got a lot to be happy about. Hey, he woke me up this morning. I know it may not mean nothing to you, but my God, my best friend, my daddy, Alpha, woke me up this morning. I'm blessed in this house. The solution was, hallelujah, help me preach, Holy Ghost. I love what Jesus did next. He said, who do you? Bobby Jean Walker, who do you say Jesus is? What is Jesus to you? Haywood, what is Jesus to you? It's a personal relationship. It's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. When you go to heaven and, and you die, when you get to heaven, mama and daddy and granny and preacher and deacons are not going to be beside you. Now, you may want to call for one to be beside you, but don't call for me because I'm going to tell truth. I'll tell truth on you. I go, to a, I go to funerals all the time, and people live like hell. And they, and they die like hell. But all of a sudden, everybody wants to go to heaven. Can't tell you how many mamas and grandmothers and daddies have pulled me into a room and said, Brian, they were good. They don't deserve to go to hell. I remember one time they got baptized. I remember one time they walked the aisle. I remember one time they done this and they done that. They went to vacation Bible school and Awanas and GAs and RAs and all the A's. And they'll want me to preach their baby into heaven. But I'm here today to declare to you some good old, good old preaching in the house today. Now, when you take your last breath, your first breath will be either there or there. No in between, there or there. You got it. What are you going to do with it? 
You say, Brian, I don't know where I'm going. Let me go ahead and tell you, if you don't know, you're lost. I'm not going to candy coat your stuff no more. If you don't know or if you're questioning, listen to me. I, sometimes the devil wants me to question. But I know deep, 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 deep down inside. Sometimes I got to go deep down in my heart. But I know that I'm born again. I know I'm going to heaven. And it may be today, it may be tonight. But I know, and let me go ahead and break another lie that's in this, in this community right now. If the Holy Ghost is not drawing you, you're lost. You cannot save yourself. You cannot go with an emotion. The Holy Spirit has to draw you. John chapter 6 tells you, unless the Holy Spirit is drawing you, <laughs> you're drawing yourself. So I just wonder, is it just possible, the reason why so many people walk the aisle and they walk out the door and they never come back is because they draw on their self and God didn't draw them. I know that's a fact. And they go out to the same old vomit, same old stuff, live like they're living, but here's the dangerous part. They'll tell you, I remember being at El Camp, and I remember saying a prayer, but if the Holy Ghost is not drawing you, you're in trouble. You say, Brian, why do we need the Holy Ghost? Yeah, I'm telling you, he helps you get to Jesus. And then when he gets you to Jesus, he's inside of you. He lives in you. He teaches you. He trains you. He'll never leave you. He's all time living in you. Hallelujah. So the thing I want to ask you today is who is Jesus to you? I love Peter's answer. He says, I know what everybody else says about you. But let me tell you what I, what I say about you. Can you say this this morning? Listen to me. Peter said these words. You are. He didn't say you may be. He said, no, you are. You, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are Jesus Christ. You are the one who saved my soul. You are my Redeemer. You are my God. You're my rock. You're all I got. And when the world turns their back against me, in trials and 450 prophets of Baal stand against me, my God, I'll call fire down from heaven. Don't mess with the God in me, hallelujah, because I'm telling you, he's a good God. He's a good God. The reason why I live so passionate for God, the reason why I get red-faced and red-eared and all this, and I dance for God, I sing about God, I preach his name, I live his name, is because I know him. And when you know him, you know him, listen to me, when you know him, Sometimes you can't do what you used to do. I know him. I know him. He cleaned me up. And as long as I'm alive, I'll testify. I'll be the forerunner in the wilderness. If I have to be like John the Baptist, I'll be the forerunner. I refuse to let the enemy win. I refuse. Listen to me. You've got to get this in your spirit. Because you are the hands and the feet and the eyes and the ears of Jesus. No matter where you're at, people are watching. When you don't think people are watching, they're watching. Little kids all the time, they come up to me and there's one thing they say, they evidently like this, when I do the ain't no party like the Holy Ghost party. I got little kids running up to me and they'll pull my little pants leg like that and they'll look, they'll look up at me ain't no party like the Holy Ghost party. And it don't stop, it won't stop. As long as I'm alive, I'll testify. I know whom I believe in because my salvation means something to me. Y'all get this this morning? My salvation means something to me. I was lost and undone, broken, busted, and disgusted on my way to burn in a real hell. We've lost our joy in the churches. God, he saved me. He turned me around. He set my feet on the solid ground. And now I'm tore up from the floor up. Now I can't shut up. I love my Jesus. I all I got. He's all I got. I can't be quiet. He's my solution. He's my rock. He's my God. He's all I need. He's all, I mean that with all my heart. Sometimes I think God allows us to go through the valley of shadow of death just to see, just to 
see where our heart's at. But God, you're still my solution. It don't look good. It don't look good. Money's not coming in. But Lord, you're my solution. You're my antidote. Hallelujah. You're all that I got. You're all that I got. And I said it in my mind. My mama was here this morning. And I had to look at her because mama raised me right. Even when they didn't want to go to church, mama would always grab my right ear and pull me to church. When I didn't want to go to church, mom had something back a long time ago they still got today. It's called WMU, Women's Missionary Union. I was the only boy up in that meeting. I didn't understand it. I was just a bunch of women around me. But mama said, you sit there and you listen, you'll learn something, boy. And I sat there, and I, at the time, I didn't like it. Sunday night would roll around, and oh, I was playing basketball with my friends, and mama said, Brian Keith, it's time to go praise the Lord. I don't want to go, mama. I don't care. It's time to praise the Lord. I'm, I want to encourage you as parents. I know you're sitting here and your kids may be up and down and running, this, that, and the other. Grab the right ear and say, boy, sit down, shut up, and listen to the Word. I'm sitting there telling you today that God's Word will not come back void. What I'm trying to tell you today is that I know some of you had to push yourself to come to church. But I'm sitting there telling you today that God is your solution, that God is your answer. And thank you for being here today because you're going to leave more blessed than you did when you came in. He's good. He's good. Jesus is my solution. The last point I want to give you. Listen, after you settle in your heart, the problem was they didn't know Jesus. God said, who am I to you, Allison? Who is he to you, Scott? Greg, who is Jesus to you? He's just good to you on Sunday. Monday you drop him off and you pick him back up on Sunday morning. Most people do that. Most people do that. But who is God to you? And once you have the solution, you've answered that. Here's the third point, and I want to give it to you, and I'll be quiet. Jesus gives you purpose. Jesus will give you purpose. Listen to me. Once Peter realized who Jesus was, he finally figured out who he was in Jesus and who Jesus was in him. Once Peter realized who Jesus truly was, Jesus told Peter who he truly is. And Jesus called Peter his rock. Jesus used Peter to build his church. Now think about this. And today, it went from Peter being the rock. Acts chapter 2 was the day of Pentecost. That's when the church was established. And today, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we are the church. So listen to me. When God now is saying these words, Peter, I need you to build my church. Peter preached on Pentecost. 3,000 souls got saved. And today, we represent the church. I know some of you say, well, I can find God out in the woods. Have you ever led a bear to the Lord? I double-dog dare you to get in front of a bear and kneel down in front of him and tell him that the Lord loves him. He's going to say, yes, God is good, and now you're my supper. Let's clap our hands, praise the Lord, it's time to eat. You, gonna, you better hope you have a good relationship. You better hope you're living right, because it's going to get tight. So what I'm trying to tell you is a lot of people don't understand that when we come together as a church, there is a purpose. There's a reason. We just don't play the drums and the guitars just to entertain you. I do not for one moment get up here to preach. I hope I never become a professional preacher. I hope y'all, Donna, and all the congregants, I hope y'all never become professional Christians. Greg, I hope y'all never become a professional band. Because I still believe it takes the Holy Ghost. I still think it takes the Holy Ghost. And I want to show you something powerful. He says these words in verse 18. Upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not overcome it. Verse 19 says, and I give you, the church, listen to me, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Oh, hold on, preacher. God said these words. Hang with me. I give you the keys to heaven. Now, Dana, we got a problem. 
The problem is they really don't know Jesus. But the solution now is, how many of y'all are born again, know Jesus Christ? If you were to die right now, not because you're here, but because you know him, you've asked him to save your soul, forgive you of your sins. You said, God, come into my heart, and Lord, I make you Lord of my life. How many of you were to die right now, you're going to heaven? Okay, there's some hands not up. Listen to me. But the ones, hand, the hands that are up, what if I told you, according to Matthew 16, 19, Allison, when you got saved, God handed you some keys. He handed you some keys. He said, those keys is keys to heaven. Woo! Those keys are your keys to your miracles, your signs, your wonders. And I'm telling you, this is the truth. Read your Bibles. When you got saved and born again and became the church, God hands you some keys. You say, Brian, what was the keys? I'm glad you asked. The keys represent power and authority. The keys represent all power and all authority. So what God is saying, church, and I believe if he, had, if he was here today and says, you know what, you don't have the problem, you've solved that. The solution, you've, you've answered that. You've made me Jesus, the Lord of your life. But I believe Jesus would ask now, what are you doing with your keys? Have you lost your keys? Have you misplaced your keys? Are you trying to put a key in a lock that don't work for you? Maybe it's because, listen to me, some of you are not using your keys that God has given you. God has given us keys to heaven. Whether you believe me or not, you've got keys that unlock your blessings in heaven. You don't hear preaching like this much because you know why? The church has shut it down. You don't hear preaching like this much because you know what they'll say? That's prosperity. You don't hear preachers like this much, but show me in the Bible. You can't sit there and say it's not real. i got scripture today that is written in red saying, I've given you keys. How come you're not using them? Come on, church. Could it possibly be? Could it just possibly? Y'all with me? See, I got you, preacher. Could it possibly be? Oh, we're saved. We're born again. But the reason why you've not found your purpose is because you've not used your keys. See, God is the master key. God is the one that's going to let you unlock your potential. And I know it's a very unpopular preaching, but I'm going to preach it anyhow. That I truly believe whatever is holding you, hindering you, or binding you cannot stop you. I'm going to say it again. Whatever is holding you, hindering you, binding you cannot stop you. Can I stop you? You know why God said in verse 20, he said, I warn you, don't you dare, Jimmy, tell anybody that you've been with Jesus Christ. Don't you tell them what I got for them. You know why? Most people come to the Lord just for the benefit. Listen to me. I'm going to help some of you. The reason why God said don't you tell nobody is because they had to go find their own salvation. They had to find their own salvation through Jesus. So many people have walked the aisle. So many people have said a prayer, but there's not been no solution. There's not been no change. I'm going to tell you something as your pastor. If there's not been a change, I don't know if there's been a salvation. Boy, this is some tough preaching. But it's true preaching. If there's not been a change, I question if there's truly been a salvation. See, every time I've read that God encountered people, they changed. Saul became a Paul. Luke chapter 24, when he was walking on with Jesus Christ on the road to Emmaus, he said these words, he said, man, did not our hearts burn within us? I'm sitting here telling you that the church, two things has happened. Either they have backed off and they're comfortable in mediocrity, they're just getting by, and I believe that's a lot. They, they're satisfied with just being saved. Oh, my God. They're just satisfied coming to church. They're just satisfied putting an offering in every once in a while. They're just satisfied working in GAs and RAs and all the A's. And they're just satisfied coming to church. But I'm sitting here telling you today, if the God in me can change me, restore me, and put a fire in me, he can do it for you. He can do it for you. He can do it for you. You say, Brian, that's all you talk about. I'm not going to shut up. 
until you put up. Not going to do it. Because you will not blame me when you get to heaven. You will not be able to say, well, the preacher didn't tell me this. I'm sitting here telling you, God, when you got saved, Barry, God said, congratulations, here's some keys to heaven. Have y'all ever thought about it like that? That angel, when you got saved, God said, congratulations. Here's your, here's your keys to heaven. All access is yours if you want it. If you really want it. Donnie, here's your keys to heaven. All, everything you need, access, miracles, signs and wonders, everything you need if you want it. <laughs> Haywood, Beacon, Elkhorn, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? You may be sitting here today, sitting there going, man, I don't know who Jesus is. Can I tell you the solution is Jesus Christ? He wants to save you right now. And when he saves you, listen to me. If you listen, not you start talking. You're talking. Because I'm being honest. When I, when I preach the word of God, that's the, I'm going to be honest with you. There's no reverence in God's house no more. There's no way. If y'all don't like me, I'm sorry. Because here's what I know. There's no way you can be text messaging. There's no way you can be throwing messages back and forth. There's no way you can be doing that and letting God get in your spirit. There's no way. Yeah, that's some good preaching anyhow. I'm trying to help you. I am really trying to help my heart. Why am I a pastor? Because i got a pastor's heart. If you go to hell in here today, it's because you chose to go to hell in here today. <laughs> there is a fire that is burning and it's hot as hell. It will burn you and the worm will never die. I don't know about you, but I believe we're living in the last hour. And if there was ever a time to have the solution and the antidote and the ever, all the answers. I'm telling you, I need the keys, hallelujah. I need the keys to heaven. He says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. You know why? You know why, Greg? Because it's mine. Listen to me. Please listen. In heaven right now is answered prayers, but nobody's taking their keys and unlocking heaven. Lost people, one day, Listen to me. There's going to be lost people pass by you. And I, I firmly believe if I was a lost person dying and going to hell, I would try everything in my power to try to get into heaven, especially. And you say, Brian, it ain't going to happen. You're right. Once you make your decision here, done. But can't you see this in heaven? I imagine if we're going to be there, the Bible says we're going to judge the angels. Wow. We're going to judge the angels. Now imagine if I was a lost person, I sit there and go, Hey, Woodrunner, I've seen you, but you've never told me about Jesus. You had the keys to heaven, and you never unlocked those access. Where my keys go? They're my keys. That fits my truck. That fits Dana's truck. Hers is mine, and mine's hers, and more all that good stuff. This is the key to get to my mama's house. Told me, I didn't know you had that one. I grabbed the wrong key. This key right here will not get in my office. The only thing this key right here will open is the storage room. Just maybe we've got the key, but we're trying to open the wrong door. I'm preaching now. I'm preaching now. Now see, you got to find the key that works in your marriage and open your guilty of marriage. Ugh. Ugh. You got to open up the key to your marriage and see the gift that God has given you. What if I told you right now, James? There's a brand new vehicle right out there. It's yours. All you got to do is go get it. You really don't want it? That, that's great. That really, that's what Christians do. Listen, listen. I'm preaching now. I'm 
Lord, I'm okay. I'll get through it. I got a check coming Friday. And God says, just do it. All your prayers are in heaven right now. And I mean this. I'm looking you dead in your eyes because I feel this in my heart. You've got the key to heaven. Did I, did I make this up? Did, did I read this in the Bible? Did I read it? God says, that now we've got the solution. I'm Jesus. i got a foundation to build off of. Now I've took the keys away from Satan, and you've got the key. Hey, Holly, heaven. No. I'll just take a sack. Here's the key. It's so little. Yeah, I'll take this one. This one right here has got my padlocks in my garage. I'll sleep in the garage. We don't take what God has offered. You're hind- watch this. You're hindering the blessings of God. God says all power, all authority, all gifts, everything you need is in heaven right now. You got the key. Open the door. Open the door. Somebody say, I'm opening the door. It's your key, Daniel. It's your key, Daniel. Open heaven. Hey, I can't do it. You're right. You never will. Mark, church, this key opens heaven. This key opens heaven. How do you react to that? How do you react, JC? You're, this key is everything you need in heaven. Would you take it? That's mine. He said, I got my own. I got my own. I got my own key. Praise him. Huh? So here's the thing. Are you using your key? This sermon really set me on fire. Because God literally, I really believe with all my heart, the next time you pray, listen to me, You've got a key to heaven. Y- y'all get this? You've got a key to heaven. Your marriage has a key in heaven. Your children are a key in heaven. And you know why? You've got the master key to heaven. His name is Jesus. You, your key. You, your key. I can't get that out of my heart. You, your what? If you would stand to your feet. What if I told you the reason why some of you, some of you, may have never found your purpose in life? Watch this. It's because you've never settled in your heart who Jesus is to you. I really believe that. The reason why so many people are like the wind. Got a bunch of seed and just sold up, and the wind scatters it everywhere. Could it be, y'all listen? Could it be the reason why you have not found your purpose? Because you've never settled in your heart who Jesus is. We know him here. He's Alpha Omega, the first and the last, the great I am, Abba, Daddy, Jesus, El Shaddai, Jehovah Nisi. But what is it to you? When you settle that in your heart, I'm helping you. When you settle that in your heart, who Jesus is to you, you'll find purpose.